All right, good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And uh, we're here in Reno, Nevada. Gates Brain Health is, and we've done a lot of talks recently on POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, starting with discussions on anxiety and then neuropathy and autoimmunity and hormones. Tonight was supposed to be a conclusion broadcast, but I realized it had escaped me that. Uh, I had not talked about at least half the material. So thanks to the prompting by some some friendly viewers uh, who said, you know, wasn't there more you were going to talk about? Uh, I realized about an hour ago, yeah, duh, uh, what was I thinking? So nonetheless, we're going to talk about this condition called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and in this discussion on POTS. So let me go from the beginning. Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. What is it? Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a genetic disorder. Um, somewhere around 20 different uh, genetic polymorphisms can account for this condition. The genetics of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome basically relate to connective tissue, and so EDS patients have connective tissue issues. So they have characteristics of hypermor hypermobility, they may have vascular components. Technically, there's 13 different varieties of EDS. And the hypermobility variant, if I remember correctly, is the most common. Um, but EDS is a condition where you want to look at your symptoms. Right here, I have the diagnostic criteria for it, where you can go through this entire checklist yourself and add up the points. Uh, and basically, this is what your doctors are going to do as well. If a patient is suspected of having EDS, then they're probably going to be referred to a geneticist, and then the final determination will be made. <clears throat> what I will say in clinical practice is that there tends to be more ambiguity than that when patients go to see the geneticist. Uh, frequently, I've had patients who see the genetic specialist, and they say, yeah, you may have it, you may not. It looks like you may have it. So it hasn't been as cut and dry in the patients I've seen with EDS, but nonetheless, EDS is an entity that oftentimes is overlooked by doctors and lots of times it can take a patient. I think I read a, an article out of the European Organization for Rare Diseases or something like that, where they said on average, it takes an EDS patient seeing 20 different specialists, 20 to get a diagnosis. So I think it's just good relative to POTS, and I'm going to circle back to this uh, and how these two conditions seem to be associated, that if you have hypermobility or, you know, your skin is really stretchy or you've had a lot of stretch marks throughout your life, reading through this diagnostic criteria may be a benefit and may be something that you can talk to your doctors about if you feel that this is an issue. So. Again, you can see up here, you know, can you bring your thumb down to your wrist? Uh, can, have you been somebody who dislocates your knees or your, your shoulders throughout your life? You know, when you, can you contort yourself into these weird positions? Can you stand flat-footed or have you ever been able to stand flat-footed and then put your hands or your palms on the ground? Um, and then there are all these other elements of EDS that you can read through. So I'm not here to do EDS the complete justice. I know a lot of you who are going to watch this are really up to speed on EDS. Um, it's not a demographic that I, I treat a lot of, but I think it's really good for any doctor to, who's treating POTS to be aware of EDS um, because you'll see later on the broadcast that there is an association. So this is an article uh, out of Curious. That's the journal Curious, uh, where they were looking at patients at the Cleveland Clinic. And so they were looking at for sure diagnoses of EDS and the overlap with gastrointestinal disorders. And as many of you know, POTS has overlaps with GI symptoms. And so they basically found that a lot of EDS patients have, let me see here, a lot of them have motility issues. So gastrointestinal motility issues. When you have dysmotility, in fact, 76.2% of the patients they looked at had dysmotility at some point in their alimentary canal, either their stomach, their esophagus, their intestines, their colon. 
like three quarters of them have dysmotility. And when you have dysmotility, what happens? Typically, you're going to have overgrowth of bacteria, which can lead to things like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which leads to more gas, and it creates this vicious cycle. And here, just highlighted a few things, talking about how EDS is seen in one out of 5,000 people. That's really not that uncommon. So uh, characterized by joint hypersensibility, or excuse me, skin hypersensibility, joint hypermobility, atrophic scarring, and generalized tissue fragility. And then in the EDS world, you're, when you start reading about this on Google, if you think that you have it, then there's going to be some discussion, well, is this an autoimmune illness? Um, most sources are going to say absolutely not. EDS is a genetic illness. It's a genetic, uh, it's a genetic condition, so to speak, more than an illness. But in this article, out of Therapeutic Advances in Neurological Disorders, they found that unexpectedly, a couple patients who had EDS with some central nervous system manifestations, when they gave them plasmapheresis, which is basically a, a treatment that you use for autoimmune patients, that their symptoms improved, their pain improved. And one, one of the individuals, the MRI findings, I believe, of uh, neuromyelitis optica, like went away. So kind of interesting. So typically we do plasmapheresis for really severe autoimmune conditions, really severe conditions like Guillain-Barre syndrome in the acute form. Um, I believe we're even doing some plasmapheresis for current infectious diseases that are prevalent all over the world that you probably read about in the news every day. So, uh, so we have that. And then on the topic of whether EDS is associated with POTS, it really depends on who you read. And so I read a number of articles where they basically poo-pooed the idea, so to speak, and they said, well, in actuality, it's just an association. There's no scientific evidence. That's always the term that's thrown out there. Um, but this brand new article out of the journal Autonomic Neuroscience and and the authors in this journal or people who are publishing in this journal tend to be up to speed on POTS probably more than any other journal except the Journal of the American Heart Association that I can find. And so they looked at 91 POTS patients and they found EDS or they found that out of those 91 that a significant percentage of them tested positive for having EDS. In fact, I think it was around 28 out of the 91 POTS patients fulfilled the criteria for EDS. That's a big deal. So we're upwards of getting close to a third of POTS patients are showing signs of EDS. So when you read online about POTS and EDS, this is something to look into. Again, go back up to this first slide. You can Google it. Basically, it's the diagnostic criteria for hypermobile, hypermobile EDS. Um, and so there are other forms of EDS. And if you are questioning it, then go ahead and see an EDS specialist. But yeah also needs to be considered in the world of POTS. Thanks for listening. There's our contact info if you have any questions. I'm going to pan over to Facebook to see if we have any comments that I need to attend to. And <laughs> thank you for the really nice comments. And uh, yes, I would love to be in Colorado someday as well. So I would love to be everywhere if possible. So we'll see. We'll see. So everyone have a great night and I will talk to you soon.